who have been sexually abusive or exploitive. It's important that people who work in this field are knowledgeable and experienced. It's very difficult to work in this field without any experience of working with children, without any understanding of child sexuality, what is normal, what is not, what is exploitive, what is not, what is experimental, what is not, um, but also knowledgeable about the type of program that appears to be most effective um, with this group of children as a whole. And just to say that the cognitive behavioral approach is one that we have found most useful um, in our practice, our experience with work with these children, but it does not exclude other ways of approaching the problem of um, inappropriate sexual behavior with, with children. So one has to keep one's mind open and not believe that one has to say just simply on that track. One uses it as a base and one uses the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy as a base, but one uses other modalities and theories and interventions according to the assessment you've made of the child and the child's need and perhaps the needs of the greater family. It's important to be licensed to provide services or registered as a professional, either in psychology, social work, psychiatry. Um, sometimes we have found um, other professions able to add value to the work we have done um, with some of these children. And it's important to have support in service provision. It's very important that we consider very carefully, and these are things that we have now left behind, I think, in terms of our practice, intrusive procedures, such as the use of the plasmograph, um, in which uh, it measures penile um, erections, the polygraph, and most certainly with children and adolescents, the use of anti-androgen medications is not advised. One must remember that this is a time of growth and development, um, and the use of these medications can in actual fact interfere with that and result in physical features that actually compromise the child's ability to use a psychosocial treatment program. Um, we also need to be very careful about labeling children even um, on the basis of a careful assessment process, um, but particularly when the child is still in the crisis of discovery of his or her behavior, often when the victim perhaps has just disclosed or the abuse has been just been discovered, this is a crisis. And to actually do an assessment of a child that you see as final and absolute at that time of a child's life is not appropriate. One needs to look at assessment over a period of time um, in order to really have a good picture. When a child's back is to the wall, they may deny, they may present with all sorts of behaviors that are related to heightened anxiety, fear, panic, and so on. But it's also important that we consider ethically our obligation, not just to the child, but to the community. Um, and it, we do consider the needs of everybody when we are looking at work with this particular age group. We cannot ignore the needs of the victim. We cannot put the needs of the child who's um, behaved inappropriately before the needs of the victim. Um, some elements that make ethics here quite complicated. This is often a coerced treatment population. You often find that these children do not come into therapy willingly and voluntarily. There's usually a parent or perhaps the threat of a court case or perhaps a police injunction or perhaps it's a condition of a sentence, but very few children uh, come into this kind of treatment situation as a voluntary patient. And often their parents and caregivers are not voluntary either. Um, they may still be denying their child's behavior or see it as a behavior that doesn't warrant uh, an intervention. Um, minors are on the whole considered to be a vulnerable population, but this population of children 
even more so. Um, we also have to remember too that very often our assessments here are used for forensic purposes. Um, and sometimes we are responsible as practitioners in this field for life affecting decisions um, that uh, then become, they chart the course of the child's life. And we need to be uh, really very, very uh, thorough in any reporting that we do in a forensic situation. But certainly if you have a child in therapy on a program such as this and a court case is still pending, or perhaps the child has been placed on diversion, in other words, charges have been pended, uh, the out, pending the outcome of treatment, most certainly one has to be extremely careful about one's work with the child and one's eventual assessment that one puts forward in a court situation. We also have to be very aware of our own and others' emotional reactions to sexually aberrant behavior and the need to separate victim and offender services. But having said this, I think it's really important to remember that many of these children who come to us as having committed uh, an offence or having behaved inappropriately sexually have victim histories or a history of some other kind of gap in their childhood, maybe emotional rejection, a lack of emotional closeness with a parent, perhaps it's exposure to pornography, etc. And we need to be careful that we do not ignore the victim issues when you are working with children who have problems with aggressive or inappropriate sexual behavior. That where there has been victimization, we acknowledge it, we work at it as though um, the child is a victim, because often this opens the door to the child understanding their behavior and its impact on others. So, Yes, in terms of your treatment center, you need to separate the child victim from the children who are sexually inappropriate. Um, but one needs to be remain in touch with the possibility that you may be working with a child who has been victimized. So competency of the clinician, very important. Be a licensed mental health professional, social work, psychology, psychiatry, high level of knowledge and experience, work under supervision. These kids can really pull you into their world and it's so important that you do have a consultant that you can discuss this with. Um, and also, if you can, join one of the professional associations for working with those with difficult sexual behaviors, inappropriate sexual behaviors, and illegal sexual behaviors. There's the International Association for the Treatment of Sexual Offenders, IATSO, and there is the American Association for the Treatment of Sexual Offenders. So these um, organizations offer a wealth of information through their websites, through their conferences, and through their membership. It's important too that you inform clients about what you are doing and how you are going to do it. Uh, one must explain the difference in terms of standard mental health care and court ordered programs. It's important that they have a clear verbal and written description of the program. And there are many myths out there as to what actually happens in programs for um, children who commit offenses or who are sexually inappropriate. It's important also to give a list of requirements for program completion. And we use a lot of group format um, sessions in our uh, programs. So one would need to explain the group format. Um, often children and parents come into the treatment situation expecting individual or perhaps family therapy. So the group format uh, for therapy needs to be explained. And certainly in our programs, we have found individual work with the child, um, individual work with the parents and sometimes uh, joint work with both parents, uh, work with the family as a whole, group work, all of these modalities um, can be used very productively with this group of children. Important to explain to the families the limits of confidentiality 
and to um, make sure that if you need to go to someone else for information, which I hope will be part of your assessment, because assessment needs to take into account a very wide range of factors, that you have a signed release of information. And not just for the family members, I think it's important to discuss with the child, his or her own self, that you are going to be seeking information, maybe from other professionals, um, maybe from the victim or the victim's family, maybe from school, um, to look at risk in that kind of environment and so on. We also need to explain mandatory reporting. Many people come and see therapists believing that what they tell a therapist will be absolutely confidential. Most countries do not allow absolute confidentiality in therapy um, and require mandated reporting even of social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists who are working with sexual offences. So know your country mandatory reporting laws and if you are mandated to report, explain what this means, how it happens, how you will deal with it and how you advise the family to deal with it. And then clarify the policy of your program on reporting previous illegal sexual behavior. And every program should have a program policy that sets out what it's going to do, how it's going to go about it, and how it deals with things like prior sexual behavior that perhaps has not been reported, is not part of uh, why this particular child has come to you at this particular time. I think it's important to review ethical standards with families and to talk about consultation with colleagues. And it is important that you know about the ethics committees in your particular state, professional organizations, um, before you start work with this, uh, in this field. But also consult with experts in the field. What was really wonderful for us in South Africa is when other organizations began to do this work and we could phone each other and support each other and uh, discuss cases, discuss issues that perhaps we were stuck with in the therapeutic program or work with a specific child. And that can be immensely valuable. I think the more people who support you in this work, the more comfortable you become in the uh, work, uh, this kind of work, but the more expert you become as well. So, with it, concluding just the comments on ethics, do no harm. It does, these children, treatment of these children does involve some very unique ethical issues. And make sure that you are licensed or registered, competent, and use consultation to resolve your ethical dilemmas, but also your treatment challenges. Now, I believe not everybody can work in this field. I think that some of us may not be suited to work with children who have difficult sexual behaviors. Um, some of us may have such a clear victim orientation that they find a shift very difficult. Um, some of us may have histories that make work with these children and adolescents very difficult. And I think it's really important to be honest about this, honest with yourself and honest with colleagues. Um, just to share a comment that one of uh, my colleagues made when we were starting off these programs, she said to me, Joan, don't let any of us who are insecure with our own sexuality do this kind of work, because that also affects how comfortable we are and how we work with these children and adolescents. And I think that's very true. I think you've got to be okay, or kind of okay, with your own sexuality. You also need a long-term commitment to this work. And one of the reasons here is sometimes for some of these children, especially older children, treatment can be long-term. And many times these children have issues and problems um, with attachment and with bonding and trust. And so sometimes you find that where therapists change midstream in a therapeutic process with one of these children, um, the child becomes derailed for a period of time. 
So a long-term commitment to the work, but that doesn't mean you have to work with offenders for the rest of your life or children who offend for the rest of your life. You've also got to do, have the ability to develop relationships with these children. And it's difficult sometimes. Sometimes one is so shocked by their behavior that developing a relationship might be a real challenge. Um, you've also got to have the ability to tolerate the disapproval of others. Some people feel very negative about the possibility of working with these children and rehabilitating them. You've also got to work in such a way that you reject the behavior without rejecting the person, be it a child, an adolescent or an adult. You have to have high energy when you're working with kids. You've got to have an ability to sustain that energy, remain objective, keep your perspective. And that happens with the assistance of consult consultation um, and self-care. I also think that this is not the kind of work that just fits into a normal working day. One of the things we need with these children is for them to normalize their lives and if they can go back to school to go back to school and have a normal school day. So we found that often when we were working with these children we needed to work after school and sometimes after school hours and certainly if we were working with their parents and families that would have to be out of normal working hours and you cannot work with the child without working with the family. Therapists must be willing to read and study. This is a very fast developing field. There's always something new to read, always something new to learn in terms of this work. One has to be optimistic about change and willing to tolerate the fact that change comes slowly. Have to be able to cope with transference and counter-transference issues able to work in a multi-professional team because you will at times need to consult with maybe the police to whom the uh, case has been reported and has the victim statement, perhaps with um, the child's medical doctor because the child has some medical need, perhaps with the prosecutor um, or the state attorney who's prosecuting the case in order to have a team-based approach to how, how this child is going to move forward. One has to be comfortable to be working within a number of theoretical approaches and the therapeutic modalities. I think it's very important not to be blinkered. And one has to establish and maintain very clear and appropriate boundaries between ourselves as therapists and the children we work with, and to ensure that any self-disclosure remains responsible and appropriate. Um, and yes, Self-disclosure should be limited in any therapeutic relationship, but I think this is an important consideration when working with these children and their families. Um, one must have a willingness to acknowledge errors. I must confess we made a lot of mistakes when we started off doing this work because we didn't know what would work. Um, we sometimes excluded children from therapy who, when I look back, um, perhaps we should have included. We believed that a child who did not acknowledge their behavior didn't belong in a therapeutic program. We discovered that that is not true, that sometimes a therapeutic program can help the child to acknowledge the behaviors. One needs to be self-confident. One needs to have a sense of humor, a respect for oneself and for others, comfort with our own sexuality, an ability to deal with intimate issues. Sex is an intimate issue. We talk a lot about sex when it's out there, but when it comes to my own sexuality, we're requiring children and adolescents to talk about their own sexuality quite intimately and to understand what contributed to the offensive behavior. So we need to be able to deal with that. An ability to offer praise when appropriate. These kids are often short on positive reinforcement and sometimes re positive reinforcement from therapists can be very encouraging. I'm really glad you told me about that. That was a difficult thing to do, but it helps me understand where you're coming from. It might be a nice way of um, praising a child who's had a lot of difficulty in owning their behavior. And you need to have a, a sense of responsibility for your own life and avoid sounding like a victim yourself. 
Because if you do, that is something that will eventually be taken advantage of in this particular field. Challenges are transference and counter-transference. It's so easy to become attached to the younger children that you work with and even the adolescents. Co-therapy is always preferred if it is possible, but there are times when it is not possible um, in treatment facilities that perhaps have limited resources. Consultation can be difficult if you cannot find anybody in your immediate environment who does this kind of work. So you might have to go further afield. Managing your own emotions can sometimes be very difficult when you hear some of the descriptions of the behavior that you're having to deal with. And sometimes it's hard to manage your own anger or your own sadness um, when you're working in this field. One of the big dilemmas we have is further disclosures um, because we are mandated reporters of any sexual crime. And this includes any sexual offence committed by a child above the age of 10 in South Africa. That is the age from which children could be held criminally liable for their behaviour. Um, between 10 and 14, it's a rebuttable presumption. But after 14, then children are criminally responsible for their behavior. They can still be diverted away from the criminal justice system. But one has to think through how do I deal with the other information that comes to me during the therapeutic process? Do I report it? Is a child still at risk? Does it change my assessment of this child who originally came with a single incident of an inappropriate behavior? Therapist gender can be quite important. I must say when we've been working with groups of boys, it's been very helpful to have a male co-therapist um, because a lot of the time we find that these young people lack appropriate male, ro male role models. Um, and so this can be really valuable for these young people if they are male. Hard to like clients, yeah, you get hard to like children sometimes. The separation of victim and offenders can sometimes pr produce a real kind of puzzle when the child who's actually been sexually inappropriate and the child who's been victimized live in the same household. I do believe that a rule of thumb should be the removal of the offending child if it's appropriate. Um, there are times when it is not appropriate. So one would look towards the safety of the victim very, very carefully before leaving a child who had a pattern of behavior in, a, in his own home or her own home with the child that they victimized. And again, I just want to challenge, uh, mention the challenge of children whose sexual behavior is un unacceptable who have been victims also. Preparation of yourself is important. Work in this field is not easy. It's important to know yourself. Com uh, continuous reflection, um, reflective analysis of where you are within yourself, very, very important. Get rid of your old baggage if you have any, or at least keep it under control. Prepare well for every encounter with the child and the child's family. Read, and then I've added read and read. Try to effect, evaluate the effect, effectiveness of what you do as you are doing it or as soon as you possibly can. And I'm going to talk about that in the second session, that effectiveness is not only the child not reoffending, it's also often related to other aspects of the child's behavior because these children very seldom come to you with one behavior that needs attention. Often there is a range of issues that you are trying to deal with or that the child or the family is trying to deal with. Take care of yourself. Look after yourself. It's a difficult field. And be honest. Some people can't work in this field if you can't acknowledge this and move on. Care of the self is essential. It should be continuous and regular. Avoid the myths that disempower you, like everyone I work with will never offend again. If an offender relapses, it's my fault. This work will not impact on my life. 
I shall be able to remain objective at all times. It's difficult to uh, come to terms with the fact sometimes that we're not superhuman, isn't it? So myths that are sometimes true, but usually false, these children will reoffend. Interestingly enough, research into the uh, children who, uh, the reoffenses of children who um, have committed a sexual offense or whose behavior is sexually inappropriate, they're no more likely to offend than a child who commits another kind of crime. Um, you get patterns of stealing behavior and you get patterns of sexual behavior, but you can have children who once off offend either theft or an inappropriate sexual behavior. And these children are not usually yet fixated in a pattern of sexual behavior um, that cannot be addressed. These children cannot be treated is another myth. These children will or are, they will become pedophiles. Um, and I think that one has to be alert to older adolescents who have distinct patterns of behavior, but certainly it's important not to uh, give the child that kind of life script. If one successfully addresses the treatment needs of the child, obviously one turns the child away or even sometimes the sheer shock and um, drama and trauma of having been found out, and it is a trauma that your behavior has been discovered, um, can be something that prevents reoffending in itself. Therapy is not the only uh, thing that turns behavior around. It's often a, a collection of interventions from family, from therapist, and perhaps from other significant people in the children's world, in the child's world. These behavior will progress, these children will progress to more serious crimes as time goes by. That's not necessarily true. For some children, it could be if there's no intervention. These children always lie about these, their behavior. We've often found that children are very honest once they've begun to acknowledge their behavior, very honest about what happened. Sometimes they tell us things that not even the child who's been victimized will tell us. Um, about what happened during that event. Um, and so one should not anticipate dishonesty. One should anticipate that children will sometimes try and protect themselves if they anticipate a negative response. But children will, if they are in a safe environment, often disclose the indisclosable. Denial present, prevents these children from being treated successfully. This is also not true. Um, Denial sometimes uh, can be worked on. All these children use physical force, not necessarily. They can be as seductive as adults. Children and adolescents who engage in same-sex behavior or who are gay or homosexual or lesbian, whatever the terminology you are most comfortable with, are of greater risk to children. That is a myth. Institutionalization helps these children develop more acceptable sexual behavior. That is really a high risk situation for these children. If possible at all, keep them out of institutions. Institutionalization often reinforces the very behavior you would like to um, change. And when you think about it, if you put a lot of hurting children together, children who've been hurt together, um, or children who have difficult behaviors together, eventually they do start hurting each other. And so institutionalization should be the last call, I believe, with this group of children. These children are without feeling or empathy for their victims. Often they are understanding that they've hurt someone, but it doesn't necessarily help them manage their behavior any more easily. So sometimes they do. They feel sorry for what they've done. They feel remorse for what they've done. Um, but this is not a good prognostic indicator. Sexual offending is always a rational planned behavior. Sometimes it is, but there are many children who are in a situation and take advantage of it or adolescents. And we know that childhood and adolescence is a time when children can be very impulsive. These children have no conscience about what they do. They often do. 
you do get some who do not seem to care and do not seem to be able to empathize. But most children who, who come in to this kind of treatment program um, are able to express some negative feelings about their own behavior. A cutoff between the child offender and victim is always best for the victim, especially when that victim is a child, not necessarily. Sometimes the victim needs to have a contact and sometimes it's important for the victim to hear the offender take responsibility for the behavior and that can be very healing for victims. So that has to be individually assessed for every victim first and for every child who's committed some kind of sexual offense. These children or adolescents or even adults have a, have a profile, unfortunately they don't. And it's important to remember that. Um, we also uh, want to do away with the myth that chemical castration can avoid sexual behavior, can avoid um, control, aberrant sexual behavior. Chemical castration should not be used in childhood and adolescence. And I cannot say that more emphatically because it is hormonal and usually interferes with the child's growth into adulthood. And you do find that particularly chemical castration of boys um, during adolescence, it may well make arousal slower. Um, it doesn't deal with the problems between the ears. Um, and it often, because they develop characteristics that they feel embarrassed about, like breasts and their facial hair stops growing in the normal beard pattern and their voices change, it often compromises the very thing that you would like to achieve, which is, in actual fact, better peer relationships um, and uh, ability to develop the normal kind of relationships, exploring one's own sexuality in a, a consensual relationship as they grow into adulthood. Um, I'm just going to deal with one more slide and then I'm going to stop for questions because I think we're running out of time, but we will pick up and if I can't answer all your questions tonight so far, um, I'll pick them up in the uh, second session. Just to talk a little bit about the assessment and treatment milieu. It must be pleasant. There must be respect shown to the child. Children learn respect by being respected. So although these children come to you as children who've done something wrong, respect is important. It should be tidy and uncluttered. These are often children who have other problems like uh, concentration problems. So distraction should be kept at a uh, minimum. One should facilitate a very clear focus on the behavior. Spaces for working with these children should not be too large. So a small group in a big hall um, is sometimes too sc scattering for, for children. To, it scatters their attention. So one needs a room that is appropriate for work with an individual. If you're working with an individual, if you're working in a group, a uh, space that is appropriate for a group. And large um, and small spaces, very large or very small spaces may increase levels of anxiety. It's important to have some symbolic nurturing for these children. One of the things that we see associated a lot with sexual misbehavior or sexual misconduct with children and adolescents is a lack of nurturing in their own um, lives. And so they seek nurturing through inappropriate touch. So symbolic nurturing can sometimes be very useful, like a cold drink, a little time of socialization, but a time in which the child is made to feel, I'm glad you came to therapy today. Um, and are you okay for us to kind of settle down to whatever business in hand that we're going to talk about today? Arrangement of chairs for groups is important. Um, it, we prefer a circle always in, in order that people can see each other, they can uh, look at each other's um, non-verbals as well as uh, hear their verbal behavior. Interruptions sh should be avoided. And then simple rules that reinforce focus and work. No cell phones in group um, and no cell phones in therapy for both the therapist and the child. And it's always important to remember that you, the therapist, are a model of relationship. Okay, Heather, 
I cannot see if anybody has asked any questions. Are you able to communicate with me and tell me whether or not? Yeah. Um, Certainly so, Joan. And we do have some questions. And that was such a thoughtful and thorough first half of your presentation. We just want to reiterate to everyone that we will be scheduling a second half and making those materials available at that time as well. So uh, stay tuned for more information about that. Brighton asks us, how do you know when a behavior is inappropriate and outside the realm of normal childhood sexual exploration? So a good question there, Joan. Right. So I'm going to deal with that in assessment, which I'm going to move on to in the next session. But it is very important that the kind of normal uh, exploration, body exploration, that a lot of kids get into is not kind of handled in a way that you label one or both children as abnormal. Um, it's important to state the rules or reiterate the rules. Where one would see it as abnormal is where violence has been used, where several children have overpowered a child who is clearly being victimized by a group of children, and that child could be the same age. A large age difference and a difference in maturity, not just physically, but emotionally and psychologically. Now, this actually presents us with a challenge in this field in that our experience with uh, mental disability, uh, children with mental disability, often like an older adolescent with mental disability, are often interacting um, or sexually interacting with a child who is of the same emotional or cognitive age. Um, so, but one would still see that as an abusive situation in terms of perhaps the, the physical power, etc. But that is sometimes a dilemma for the therapist where you have someone who is mentally disabled interacting sexually with a younger child. The child is definitely younger. If the person were not uh, mentally disabled, one would definitely you know, deal with it in a very serious way. But with a mentally disabled ch older child, they are the equal in terms of emotional and cognitive, um, you know, intellectual ability. And so that one would deal with slightly differently. But one would still have to deal with it. And Joan, one other question that could have uh, some impact on an organization like ISPCAN you talked a lot about the support and needing to talk to people, needing to read and reach out and knowing yourself in this field. How can an organization like ours make that easier? How can um, joining an ISPCAN help ease some of these issues for people who've either been in the field a long time or are just starting out? Well, interestingly enough, the ISPCAN does have a number of members who work with children who are sexually inappropriate or um, older adolescents who have committed some kind of sexual offence. And so one would uh, post on the listserv, one could post on the listserv as a member and say, is there anybody else working with this field? I would like to be able to consult with you either via Skype or via email. Our conferences often have papers on this kind of work. Um, and so if someone is attending one of our conferences, they can um, link with a person through uh, attending a conference. But also our website has a very, very interesting paper called Working with Men and Boys, Preventing Sexual Abuse Against Girls. And that paper talks about this field in relation to adults and children and talks about it as a primary, secondary and tertiary prevention strategy. And downloading that paper and reading it will give you a lot of information, but it also lists um, other projects around the world that are work doing this kind of work that you could uh, track down and link with. Um, you know, some of them have given their website addresses or contact details. So that particular paper on our website would be very valuable. And also, Joan, you talked about the teamwork that is so crucial in this 
type of treatment. What happens when there are differences in philosophy or treatment plan between um, you and, and members of the team trying to treat the child? That is very challenging and I cannot pretend that we do not have that, especially if they're from a different profession, maybe the legal profession, they're a prosecutor. And I think the most important thing is to do an excellent assessment of the child. Really probe every aspect of that child's life and behavior so that you can present a good case for your case and for the child. You will come across this. There will be lots of differences of opinion if you work in this field. And this is where assessment is absolutely critical, a good assessment. And of course, one sometimes does not always succeed in putting forward one's proposal for a particular child. And one has to accept that as a professional person. But assessment, a really good assessment is the critical issue. Excellent, Joan. Thank you so much. This has been such an insightful presentation and we will have a recording of this webinar and a PDF version of the slides from part one of Joan's presentation shown in her webinar today available within 24 hours on our website www.ispcan.org. So please visit us there for more information and we also encourage you to become a member if you are not already so we can continue with these informational webinars. Uh, in the future and certainly we invite you as Joan mentioned the conferences can be such a resource we invite you to join us and come together with other professionals as we celebrate ISPCAN's 40th anniversary in The Hague this October and in Dubai, Dubai in November and we will be having some special celebratory events there we are now accepting abstracts for the conference in Dubai. So again, thank you, Joan, and thank you all of you for being with us today for your time and patience. We hope you have you. a wonderful day or night, depending on which part of the world you are in. Thank you again for supporting ISPCAN.